they were in stagnation. They, there was just a civil war. No one who was very, very few people who were between 18 and 30 had a job. So everyone was living with their parents. And, there, and so mo the revolution had two staffers, which was like a secretary and a logistics guy who just made sure everyone got posters and did printing and did all these logistical stuff and janitorial work that they couldn't get anybody else to do, right? So, they, you know, the whole Apoor revolution had two staffers, okay? And it wasn't the major leaders. It was, it was people who were accountable to doing very specific tasks, okay? If 12-step, who here is familiar with 12-step? You raise your hand, I want to see. You know, 12-step, Alcoholics Anonymous, NA, Narcotics Anonymous, Al-Anon, which is for the families of addicted people, Codependence Anonymous. Those organizations you know, provide mass, millions of hours of th free therapy is given in a mutual aid system all across the United States. And there, most people go through their whole lives not seeing a paid staffer in those organizations. They're all run by volunteers. And if you, that is the predominance of social movements are like that. Now, we believe that a lot of times you need some forms of compensation for some staff. And how you do that, how you scale that is very, is, is a big debate in movements. Uh, and we, there's different systems, but it's not market-based compensation a lot of times. A lot of times it's, it's being very, very clear what you compensate, compensate for. Um, I actually, uh, I, I just met with these people from Ende Galende. And Galende, I can pronounce, can somebody pronounce it for me? The and German. Galende, you got it right. Okay. They, I met with, they, they came and visited us. We did a big presentation with us. And they, they had, a, in the, early in their movement, they debated, do we have any paid staff? Because they did these climate um, camps that you guys are probably familiar with. I, I've never heard of these things. But they said that they had models of basically creating very specific stipends that were need-based to only specific staff that needed it but most of everything was volunteer and they said that created so many problems that now they have a policy where no one's paid i think that's a big debate in the movement in cosechen if not now they do have staffers and the staffers are designed to support the volunteer infrastructure and the staffers are paid based on need-based compensation and different movements debate that we also in cosecha um, they have a whole network of volunteer houses. So they have movement houses where people live collectively and they get a small stipend just to survive to basically support the infrastructure of the movement. But then again, they're, they're focused on being organizers that support the volunteer leadership, not the other way around. Does that answer the question? Great question. Okay, and there was another question in the chat, which was, um, wait, wait, I, was, start, I was, so you go first. I thought I was before. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Um, my question is, what happens, if you can speak well to what happens when you don't have sufficient initiation training or sufficient DNA and you discover it when you've already exploded? Oh, brother. Oh, brother. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> yes. Okay. So what happens is, who here is, 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 is understands cultural hegemony? Okay. You know, can I use that term? Okay. Don't use that term. Really wonky lefty term. Okay. Basically, we have this phrase came from one of the great fathers of business management in the United States of America, Peter Drucker. He said this thing. He said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. People internalize a culture and they defend the culture, even though they don't realize it. When you're swimming in a culture, you're like a fish in water. You don't see the water. You just internalize it. Okay. Culture once it's set is very hard to change. You have to explicitly fight to change it. And once it's set, it's very hard to change, especially in a decentralized structure because there's no leaders that can say, we need to make these tweaks in our movement. So what happens, and you can see this in the democratic socialist of America, okay? 
they had a lot of front loading, a lot of DNA, and then all of a sudden all these people join and they don't have any initiation training to get people around the basic theory of democratic socialism. So basically there's a huge fight in democratic uh, DSA about the future of the movement. There's all these factions, right? There, there's like now I think there's like the, the, the moral majority, I forgot, no, the, the socialist majority fraction and the, uh, you know, there's all, I don't know, I, there's like a thousand, the, the Trotskyist fraction and this faction, and they're all battling for what is what we call the cultural hegemony, which really means the cultural norm of the movement, okay? So there's a cultural norm, and there's all these different processes about how the cultural norms of the establishment in our society enforce power. Those same things happen in a movement, but they're different. They're, it's a different process of hegemony in your movement in which people have power and, 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 they, and they exercise power in your movement. And so if you don't have really clear uh, DNA, what happens is, it, it, number one, your culture becomes, uh, the, the pre-established culture becomes a lot of times the, the ground of how you fight these, these problems or these principles. And it becomes a fight over the cultural hegemony or the norms of the movement and different factions are doing different things. That's not always a bad thing because sometimes people can vote with their feet and, you know, and there is a process at which people naturally select good elements to be incorporated as the norm. But, um, and sometimes that has to happen in a movement. Like it happens even in Akpur. So Akpur had very clear DNA, it was very complex. And then what happened is they won their revolution and now they had all these competing factions about what the DNA is gonna look like now in their movement. That's natural, you know, it wasn't a bad thing and different people had different fighting things and the movement has to fight that out. And then, and then a new alignment, a new, a new norm is established in the organization. But what I would say is that it really helps to have some level of uh, leadership that is acknowledged uh, because the tyranny of structuralistness, who here has ever read the piece by Joanne Friedman about tyranny of structuralists? It's a great piece. I'd really recommend reading it. But it basically says that just because you say it's totally horizontal and there's no, you know, everyone's equal or whatever, that's a bunch of bull crap. There's always leaders, there's always power. It's, it's about whether or not you explicitly recognize it and whether or not there's clear roles and processes versus informal power in which people are exercising it. Informal power and culture, enforcing things through, through norms becomes much more important if you don't have clear and transparent culture, uh, structures to manage processes. So basically, a lot of times in a movement, if you have a good process of figuring out what the problems are, you can have staffers at the national level or a process at the national level of taking best practices and, and figuring out what are the problems and then creating uh, tr trainings that disseminate that down to the process. And, but there's gonna be people that don't necessarily like those trainings and they get to, and it basically, it's a process of voting with your feet until you get a critical mass of people in your movement agreeing to something, and then there's alignment. Uh, and that's uh, a lot of that's still happening in momentum movements. Like momentum movements, they they didn't figure out something right in the DNA process, and their movement has something wrong that is creating lots of problems. And a lot of times, what happens is there there becomes a slow general process of getting a consensus among lots of people around a problem around training or a problem around the meta narrative or a problem around the strategy and then they have to go through another process of retraining people and getting getting alignment uh, and a lot of that is 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 not it's all non-coercive it's people voting with their feet it's people um and people getting trained and then people people in different places at one time having different cultures that are in conflict with each other that aren't aligned and then slowly the 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 best stuff rises to the top that that's the theory and i, I think that works a lot of times and sometimes it's just a fucking war i mean it just sucks i mean it's just a a battle and you can see that in occupy i mean there's multiple factions all fighting uh in the end of the movement when the movement was falling apart and it was a mess and it was very, very painful and challenging. So we're trying to, by doing front loading and good initiation training, you're sort of, 
movements don't have to have as many of those bitter fights. <laughs> and, and we have this phrase, maybe everyone should repeat it with me. Momentum creates alignment. Alignment doesn't create momentum. Momentum creates alignment. Alignment doesn't create momentum. And what do I mean by that? When, when your movement is doing great and you're getting all this media coverage and everybody's joining, the movement is more directed outward and everyone is learning the culture. And so it's like a honeymoon. Everyone's like, oh, this is great. We love each other. This is great. We're in a new culture. Like, and uh, Bill Moyer uh, uh, in this book, Doing Democracy, writes one of the, he, he talks about this, this, um, this explosion of a movement. And there's a lot of alignment. When people first join, they, they like being aligned to the culture or whatever. But what happens is the honeymoon phase wears off because you, don't, you start not getting momentum. You start not getting the, the, as much media. You start getting less people coming into the movement. And a lot of times, and, and the movement becomes less, less directed outward because there isn't as many people joining. So instead of dealing with new people coming in, it starts becoming more insular. This is a natural process. This happens in every movement. There's a bubble boom and bust cycle based on momentum. But after you lose the momentum, you lose a lot of informal alignment. And then your movement is gonna go through a crisis. That's, this is, happens in every single movement. And that challenge is hard, is harder when you don't have good front loading, good initiation training, good all that. That becomes the hard. So movements that go viral like Occupy, a lot of times can go through what we call one cycle of a movement. They can, they can do one tactic over and over again, and they can go through one big cycle. And then when the, when the momentum stops, the movement generally falls apart. This is very common. For movements who, which are, can preserve over a long period of time, they have to go through a deeper process of DNA development, initiation training, and upgrade trainings, which is what Mickey Kashtan was, you know, the question was a lot of how do you resolve a lot of things is up, you still need mass, they're not initiation training, but you still need lots of trainings that get people upgraded on the skills. And that creates alignment and unity uh, without any sort of fighting. If you have lots of good training, it's sort of, that's one of the most healthy ways to get, to get unity and alignment around uh, skills and roles and, and more complexity around narrative strategy and structure. Cool. Okay. So I think we've got two more questions and then we'll have to move on to the next section because I'm okay, concerned great. about timing. Uh, we've got three more points. That's all right. So one came on the chat. Um, can we find a way to honor the efforts of those in allied movements who are seeking um, to make anti-racism and feminism, for example, essential to their movement? Great question. Um, I am very influenced by um, realignment theory, left-wing populism in the left. Uh, this theorist called Leclau uh, and Mouf. Mouf. Uh, these, uh, these theorists uh, are neo, some people might call them neo-Marxist. Uh, you know, they're different things. But anyways, um, the best book on this, I think, is Hegemony How-To by Jonathan Matthew Smucker. And what we're talking about is that right now, the globe is in a realignment. The current parties don't make sense. Um, and people uh, all over the world are experiencing the failures of neoliberalism. And there's a realignment. Uh, about how now do we organize uh, the, the party structures, the political party structures and opinions in different countries, in the United States, for instance. And that realignment, whether how you orient to that realignment is really, to me, about strategic racism and feminism and being against the patriarchy and, and whatnot. I think that's a strategic. And what I'm saying this is that there's a lot of environmentalists who believe in their single issue, but do not actually believe in a realignment that's gonna help black people, that's gonna help people of color or marginalized people, they don't. They, they just believe in fixing their issue. And if it's Clinton, you know, if it's like Hillary Clinton or, or neoliberal Democrat, they're like, sure, no problem. It's great, they're my friends, you know? And, and a lot of those organizations get money from the same rich people that are funding the mainstream Democrats, right? 
what we need is leftist movements that specifically organize people, radicalize them so they can join what we call a people's alignment, that they can, they can join an alignment that is rejecting neoliberalism and actually talking about how big government and different things uh, uh, are needed that are, are not in the alignment of neoliberalism. And the way you talk about your movement in the meta narrative uh, doesn't, we don't believe needs to include all the laundry list of leftist causes. We believe that if you frame the meta narrative right, and the strategy is that we're going to be part, our polarization is going to be part of a strategy to organize a certain segment of the population to radicalize them so that they can join a multiracial coalition, which we call the realignment, is actually the best strategic racism that we can have. And this is the, the philosophy of Sunrise. This is the philosophy of a lot of our movements, like Cosecha and whatever. It's not our job. We can't, as a movement, the best thing you can do is organize your base, organize the base of the movement that's attracted to your movement to actually orient against neoliberalism and into a people's alignment. And that's the best thing you can do that a lot of people in the, in the immigrant rights movement in Los Angeles, that's what they want. That's what they want you to do. You know, a lot of people of color in organizations that are anti-racist want, they want you to go out and organize those populations so that they're oriented to this, this politics that actually helps them and helps all marginalized voices. That includes all of us. But that, the best way to do that isn't necessarily to, to, to have a laundry list that alienates people. We need, pe we need movements to actually organize different segments of the population that then can be uh, a true multiracial um, movement uh, a movement and a movement that that embraces all of us and that doesn't allow the neoliberal elite to separate us uh based on identity but rather uses identity to build a very powerful coalition that can that can uh really address uh, uh oppression of all sorts hey paul do you, can you guys hear me yes yeah i'm sorry i just wanted to clarify you said strategic racism a couple times and I think you meant strategic anti-racism. Yeah, sorry about that. Strategic no. anti-racism. Yes, sorry about that. Yes. I'm right. just so I make a lot of like terminology problems. I apologize about that. So strategic anti-racism. Strategic anti-racism. Yes. So we're not right. doing racism, we're doing strategic anti-racism, which is exactly the opposite strategy of what right-wing populism does. Right-wing populism is training people to be strategic racists. And so we are doing exactly the opposite. We're training people to be strategic anti-racists so that we can, be, we can uh, create unity and alignment that actually can vie for power. Great, okay, I think Anna had a point and then we'll move on to the, the, the next thing on the agenda. Question. Thanks Robin. So uh, Paul, my question sort of flowed on from the last one. And I've been thinking it, uh, I was kind of thinking it a bit reading your book a few years ago, and I was thinking it listening to you quite a lot during today, which is that your, um, I think it might be just that, that you haven't explained it maybe in the depth, but I'm trying to get at whether you're saying that it doesn't really matter that black people and other marginalized communities are not part of this 3.5% or certain mobilizations. So what I'm hearing, if I've got this right, is that you're saying focus on the goals which are tackle neoliberalism and that that's enough and have good quality training that does speak to a, a range of people. But I just feel like there's something I'm missing because it almost, it almost sounds like you're saying that it doesn't really matter if those people aren't there in that movement building process. And I don't think that's what you're saying, but can you clarify? Uh, and I'll just, I'll just add on to that. Um, you brought up the, the, the quote that I use regularly in trainings about culture eating strategy for breakfast. And obviously in majority white organizations, um, plus other issues as well, but I'm just giving that as an example. Equally with our best intentions and all of our books that we've read and all the rest of it, we will still recreate dominant cultures within our organizations. So I'm kind of just wondering about how that, how that pans out. Any thoughts? Yes. So the question is, how do we build 
power to address oppression of marginalized communities and identities uh, is very important. And how movements do that is very complex. Uh, and it, a lot has to do with what we call social movement ecology. Um, and with a popular mass protest movement, we say that it's primarily what we call attractional. And so we think that the strategic way to do that is you, you have to think about certain things, like make certain decisions that allow you to be more inclusive. That's still important uh, of different populations. But in general, you can't control a lot of that. Uh, in a mass protest movement because you're going to polarize and the way you polarize is what we call the structure of uh, the spectrum of support is it's going to attract certain populations more than other populations and the way other organizations do that structure is they they have different ways of making sure leadership is very representative from the get-go and all that our our mass protest movements are not designed to do that and i don't think that's the role in the movement ecology so what is the role of of the, of a specific mass protest movements that's built around certain issues how it's not going to be totally representative you kind of have to acknowledge that the culture you, you can make some tweaks to make it more inclusive and more welcoming but the reality of it is it's not going to be what a lot of people want it to be in being uh, as diverse or uh, having baked in a culture where everyone's going to feel safe all the time. It, that, that's just not the reality of any movement that I've ever studied. And so the Paul, question... Paul, yeah. I just want to interrupt you just briefly, just to say that, that about three or four times you've kind of polarized a bit in terms of representing a different position. So I just want to sort of flag that up and reflect that back to you. And do you know what I mean by that? Well, it's kind of, it's almost like creating a little bit of a straw man is all I'd say. Okay. Well, the, there, how you grapple with that is very complex and I'm not advocating for necessarily um, that your movement do it in this way or that way you have to figure a lot of that out. But what I believe is mass protest theory and civil resistance is a lot very attractional. And there's certain things you can do to cater to, and, and it's really important to include certain things that make people feel welcome. But I actually do not believe that we are prefigurative spaces that embody all the values of of the revolution that we're willing to see. I don't think that's possible in mass protest movements. I don't think that's what mass protest movement spaces are meant to be. Um, and people are gonna debate me on that and think I, you know, I'm wrong and whatever, and that's fine. But I, I think there is spaces in the movement that are needed for that. We need multiracial uh, spaces. We need spaces that are experimenting with a totally new culture. But I think there has to be a balance between what we call strategic and prefigurative politics of how do you um, prioritize in a mass protest movement the goals and yet have a culture that is not going to be perfect. It's going to have to be inclusive of, of targeting the public. And because of that, it, uh, it's, gonna, it's not going to be seen as... Cool. Paul, sorry. Yeah, I think you've made your point. And I've got it. I just want to point out the, the obvious, which is, of course, black people are also the public. So I'll leave it there. But thank you. Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay, so we'll move on to the next point. Um, pretty fascinating so far. I think the next one is uh, D DNA as inoculation. I'm not quite sure what that means. But Paul, do you want to speak I, to that next? I, I actually want to jump in for a second and try yeah. to try to bridge the gap that I saw here between Anna and Paul, um, which is at least say my understanding of what I'm hearing from the two of you and where I see that there can be a convergence. Um, what I'm hearing, Anna, is that you want to minimize or eliminate the ways that a mass protest movement will recreate the dominant structures with the horrific oppressive impacts 
Did I get that right? I am 100% confident that Paul would like that too. Yes. And um, I'm hearing from Paul that what, what is important for him is to recognize our inherent limitations where we are in terms of our capacity to not recreate the existing structures and to mourn those limitations and aim in that direction while recognizing that if we make not recreating the oppressive structures our main activity, it will never become a mass movement, which isn't a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a decision about which you want. Did I get that right, Paul? Amen. Perfect explanation. The way we talk about that is... And um, you can disagree with it, but I wanted it to be understood that it isn't about, about a disagreement about um, values and uh, wishes and hopes. It's, a, it's literally a strategic question of what you prioritize for what purpose. That, that, that was the thing I wanted to do. And I, I just want to say, I, to Mickey touched on, is that it's also about where in the movement ecology you do a lot of that work. Yeah. Uh, that work is really needed. I mean, we have to create spaces where we can prefigurative, prefigure different relationships and have multiracial uh, movement, uh, anti-oppression movement that includes many of the things that is, is destroying people's lives and the environment. We have to have spaces where we work a lot of that out. I mean, we need those in our movement so deeply. The question is, is what roles do different people take in, in the movement ecology? How, where, where do we do all of that work uh, and how do we do it? And how do we do that in a strategic way that includes the most amount of people? Uh, that's, that's sort of what I'm talking about. Can I just come in there? Cause it's just, that was the question I wanted to, just trying to get my head around it, but it's, it's um, just about this difference between whether you know strategic and prefigurative and prefigurative are those values and, and the way in which Anna was mentioning it was like as if the values of oppression trying to get everybody in the movement is somehow um you know it's, it, it's it's a kind of it's um the way that we talk about issues like racism and so on is, is, is it kind of almost we we're focusing on an issue rather than just on what is the meta narrative that will just bring everybody is there is there a method narrative that could bring everybody together without actually thinking about it as whether it's an oppressive narrative or whether we're talking about racism you know is, can we do you think there is a meta narrative that will actually just bring bring that together without having to bring to, to those values in without having to consider the concept of whether this is what whether we're anti-racist or not I don't know if I framed that very well <laughs> just kind of, it's like when we talk about political, we're talking about the institutions themselves for uh, how we organize power. And the power is already, uh, it, it's, it's already, it's already there. It, it's, we can't get rid of that power. The, the political is not the institution itself. We're framing it as, it as if it's out there, but it's already, it's just there whenever we organize. And um, is there a narrative we can get to which doesn't try to break everything down into these categories that we've already created. You know, in Western narrative, we've got these categories, but why do we have to work with these categories? Amen. Amen. I mean, I think um, th there's a woman, uh, he Heather McGeeg, uh, that worked at Demos. Um, and in the United States of America, she is trying to revive a meta narrative about a realignment in the United States that's anti-racist that has been led by primarily what we what we call the black uh, socialist tradition that Martin Luther King came out of. Um, and that narrative is a left-wing populist narrative that in, puts race at the center, saying race is used strategically to divide us. We have to understand that we can't be divided by race. And it actually puts that narrative as the center of of the narrative of what we need to do on the left. And I agree with that totally. Um, but I don't think every movement needs to use that narrative uh, and can't use that narrative. I don't, I don't think that, I think though that that narrative needs to be baked in so that your movement 
had is, and that's what I'm talking about with the realignment. It has to be baked in so you can understand how you fit into that narrative. Does that make sense? You need a meta narrative that isn't using that as that narrative because that narrative is really designed for a multiracial coalition that we need to take to take power. We need to figure out how these individual movements that are more single issues fit into that and 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 embrace that in the leadership, but also how they are able to. Uh, to reinforce that what we call realignment that that narrative does that make sense Anna did you want to say something else there yeah it's just a small point um, in just wanted to say Mickey uh, this isn't to criticize you Mickey because I appreciate you were trying to frame the the discussion and the the charge that was in that discussion um, but I also think it's it's relevant that you you said, uh, in, in attempting to frame it, you said, if we make that the focus in terms of if we look at actually how we relate to each other and how we work together and how we work collectively. And I didn't at any point say we should make that the focus. And what I want to frame back to you is to say that actually what's, what I think and what I see happen regularly over the years is that people think that any discussion of this or embedding this in training or really sticking it in the DNA of an organization is making it the focus and I just wonder at where that comes from and I'm not talking about you I'm talking about all of us that yeah. we polarize that and think it is one thing or the other because obviously as you can probably guess for me I don't think there is any effective climate movement unless we have everybody in part of it so I'll leave it there thank you great thank you that was a very good discussion um Paul would you like to move on to your next points oh okay next point and just so everyone knows, we've got about 25 minutes left. Uh, I think it was uh, DNA as inoculation was the next thing that Gail put it as. So uh, a lot of DNA in initiation training and in the introduction is figuring out what, what do people need to know um, so that you address some of the biggest problems uh, uh, in, in your movement. So you know, like, and a lot of that comes, some of that you can predict and some of it you can't predict. Uh, but we, what are the problems that come up most? Some of them are process problems, like, oh, everyone is trying to make all the decisions through consensus decision making at the General Assembly level, for instance. That's one of the big problems with a clamshell alliance slash occupy model. Well, then you have to bake in like, okay, we're not doing things like that. We're doing this in this alt alternative horizontal way. Uh, and baking that into the DNA, or we know that this narrative that we say of an extinction rebellion, uh, we know that lots of people misinterpret the narrative and they, they do that in a way that uh, alienates lots of people in our society. Uh, so, baking in to, to the DNA sort of, and a lot of this is in the principles, but how do we address the major problems in the movement so that you can kind of embed the wisdom of the leadership and experience that people have into uh, quickly disseminating that to people and get, getting them to, to feel comfortable about addressing those issues. So that's what we talk about as inoculation. Like inoculation means giving someone a sense of the problem uh, in their body so their body can prepare to, to be strong in defending uh, against those problems when they come in uh, or just naturally arise. Uh, one of the big ones that you have to inoculate against is nonviolence. Um, nonviolence is very important to bake into your DNA because it's, it's, it's a natural process a lot of times for people to feel angry and, if, and from, from whatever experience they have in their family lives or in you know, where they come from, having a violent reaction is, is a lot of times people's natural response to, to certain intense repression. And so having your movement inoculate and realize, okay, we need a culture of nonviolence and we need to make sure that 
that if we're if we're in these really intense circumstances with police and getting beaten up, that we're going to respond in this way. You kind of have to prepare for that. You have to inoculate that, and that needs to be baked in. And nonviolent direct action trainings that I, I was trained in are really good about inoculating around those things. And just just to say. Um, uh, anti-oppression and race are also things you, you know, if people are doing things that are racist in your movement that are excluding people, it's good to inoculate around, you know, don't do those, these types of behavior. It alienates people or it creates a space in which people don't feel included. That's one of the ways you, you bake it in. Just, um, so I did, um, well, I did some uh, this early training just to, to check something out, which is using Rising Up's eight principles, which are in that box there. I've just put in uh, in the chat box. One was, I think, um, Gail mentioned it as I think she called it the, uh, the the meta. She called it the grand strategy. So I don't get quite the name, but she called it the grand strategy. But do you? So these are like eight principles that were in Rising Up: three pillars of toxicity, emotions drivers. Disruption is key. Civil disobedience is needed. Act together across silos. Movement care. Nonviolence attracts. And just like the, those, could you see those as a kind of a that, what you were saying about ba if that was baked into people's understanding of the values and ways of working, would that be a kind of a baked in DNA? Do you think, or does it need to be something? To, is is that a grand structure? Is it a meta structure? Is it a few? How does that sit? Well, it seems like it's 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 a good beginning um, of of front loaded principles, and I I don't know enough to say you know what are the specific problems. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, uh, you probably need to do a little bit more work clarifying meta narrative. Probably yeah, there's probably gonna there's probably gonna be things that you're gonna identify that are weaknesses, where that are too vague, that need more clarification or need to be tweaked around story strategy or structure but this is a minimum dna it does have story strategy and structure as part of it um, not just these principles but also things that i see in the uk i think one of the things that i've realized just talking to people in the united states and the uk is that the uk the culture is more defined and it's more clear what the dna there's more clarity and also there's more you know there's there's um there's older leadership that have been there and that allows for people to get clarity and ask questions and things. I think in the United States, there's much more uh, vague. It's much more vague what these principles mean and there's not a clear initiation process to make that replication happen. If I can just ask another one about meta-narrative. What does this, I mean, this just comes on from Anna's perspective because this is what I, it's something that comes from my particular perspective and but it's, that when you talk about neoliberalism, there was an article that was written by a Guardian journalist who says that the problem of neoliberalism, that what it's really created is, is it's incapacitated ourselves imaginatively to understand how we can actually collectivize to the levels that are needed. And then um, he, so the, so the method is how do we collectivize? And there is in Islam, for example, this sense of a civic conscience of, of, of that is not secular. That is that you bring the political and the, the spirit together. It's always been secularism is a Western concept that has come in when through the religious wars, etc. And it's caught, and that's structurally in there, inbuilt. You could say embedded over centuries. Over centuries. So this idea of a civic collective conscience that is um, a way of being together. Um, that is, um, you know, is that could that be a meta narrative? That is that that you if you can find some way of framing that, that that is around collectivizing that is actually a global south kind of way of understanding or well there is like internal narrative in your organization it's like what are the narratives we use to and marshall gantz talks about it as self story of self of us of now, uh, and then what we, we add meta narrative. And so there's many different narratives within a movement, many narratives 
the, the meta narrative is how do we create alignment around a common narrative within a movement? And then within that, there's a meta meta narrative, which is what I call realignment, right? That's the meta narrative that needs to be anti neoliberal, anti -neoliberal uh, and strategically anti racist and all that. That's the meta meta narrative. And the movement has a meta narrative that fits within the meta meta. I don't know if this is, this is, I'm just now just getting rid of a lot of jargon, but um, the theory around narrative uh, by George Lakoff and Drew Weston and all these people's center for story based strategy is that when we're using narratives, uh, there's different narratives for different purposes, but the meta narrative is the one that's outwardly facing towards the public. It's like, and in some ways you have to acknowledge what are the dominant frames in each country in which the, the, the debates of, of every issue is being played out. And I'm not an expert to know what it should be. I mean, I, I'm not, that's actually not my specialty. There's a lot of other people that we refer people to, to how to construct really good narratives that sort of include a lot of the things that you're talking about. Um, and that is something I think is Extinction Rebellion, from my understanding, I mean, I, is, is sort of weak on, is the meta narrative, is, is thinking through. Sunrise has really built and really thought through a lot of their narrative, meta narrative, and how other narratives fit within it, and how and they do what's called public narrative, which is the, uh, how we train organizers to use narrative within the movement and the different types of narratives. And so, but what I'm hearing from you is right on that there needs to be a real thought about how how does the how do we engage with a bigger and global narrative about uh, how we build a liberation movement that includes lots of different pieces, you know? Um, and there's interesting people that are doing work and, and thinking about that, uh, but it's not really my specialty. Does that, I don't know if that answers the question. Cool. Maybe in the interest of time, um, cause we've got about 15 minutes left, we could move on to the other points and then we could have some other questions at the end if we've got time to, um, in, in the comments, in the, in the chat section. Okay. That's cool. Um, okay, so the, uh, is this a steer? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so. So I uh, thought, were you gonna go on to the numbers four and five organizing across different yeah. countries? Is that what you meant, oh, Robin? Yeah. yeah, that's what I meant, sorry. So organizing across countries. Uh, so countries have different meta narratives, right? They have different ways in which we frame stuff. So a lot of times you have to think different things need to change based on country. And, um, you know, it's hard to say, I don't know exactly what, what needs to change and what not based on the climate of the country. So, but what I do know is that to, to create alignment, you kind of need a process in which culture, the further you, 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 your movement expands and goes viral, the more the DNA gets corrupted, the more the DNA loses its integrity to have alignment and to have a functioning movement. Because what makes the movement work is that you have a DNA, even in a minimal form, that actually works, that people are excited by and they want to jump on board and then they jump on board and then the more it spreads both geographically and among people and even into other countries, the more it loses its integrity. And so the more you can, the more decentralized it becomes, the more you need initiation training and front loading to hold the integrity. Um, and the more you need uh, what we call mass training because you need a process in which people are trained not through um, hierarchical leadership, that they can get training and get the skills and resources so that your movement can be truly horizontal, that your movement can truly embrace uh, a lot of people. Now, certain movements, they don't do that particularly that well, and they have charismatic leaders uh, that, that really set the culture and is able to call shots and whatever, and that works at a certain level. But, uh, you know, if you want to decentralize a more decentralized movement that gives a lot of autonomy, it, it requires an inf a decentralized infrastructure. And uh, I think the more you go to different countries, the more there needs to be more clarity around your initiation training and your DNA so that it can spread to countries and also adapt. But it's hard to adapt something when you don't have clarity about what 
what the DNA you're adapting is from. It's hard to have a good, a conscious, good, emergent DNA that emerges strategically in a, in a country unless you know what, what is the, what's the DNA you're working from and what choices do you need to make to adapt it to its context. And one of the things that we've seen in a lot of movements and a lot of momentum movements is a, co a decentralized coaching structure. So it allows for lots of people in different, in different, you know, different places geographically. And the more diverse this is in, in ge geography, in country, in identity, the more there needs to be coaching to sort of allow people to get support in a mutual aid decentralized way and a lot of that's phone calls a lot of that's like having explicit relate coaching relationships we call that decentralized coaching some people call it different things it's just like networking some people just call it networking but there has to be uh that has to sort of be baked into the the process if not now talks about a ratio of like you know training coaching and in action that there needs to be a combination of that to scale there needs to be like uh, people need, you know, 60% action and doing things in the movement. They need, you know, uh, you know, like 10% coaching and, uh, you know, and then like 20% training in training spaces or, you know, whatever ratio it is, I'm not sure, but they, they have a ratio to, to, so that they have an understanding of what they need to scale at the right pace so that the movement has enough alignment and enough, enough resilience to grow and to be effective. And I make a point with Gail. Hey Gail, go ahead. Hi. Um, thanks uh, for all that, Paul. I, um, thinking about growing across countries and also the sort of meta narratives and grand strategy and all that, but I, I'm just kind of sitting with this instinct at the minute i mean we're talking about the end times for humanity uh and people are waking up in a in a in a, what feels to me like a really different way in. What i guess what i'm thinking about is um or dreaming about is the possibility now of a global movement of movement of um you know that, that maybe it's good that we can figure out what our global you know international peace was um as well and we talked about trying to figure that out too but it, it feels to me like there's an opportunity and probably like post april to uh ask for collaborations um i, I mean it, it, it speaks to the peace that and racism as well you know to, to sort of think what, which movements what what message out there might be that um, movements and movements across the world want to align around to actually have a co-creation around that. I guess that's never happened. Uh, I mean, maybe it has, but it feels like that's what's needed next. So this is not stops being about extinction rebellion. This starts being about like how do we turn this thing around with with all of these um, issues aligned together because we all know that we need the system to change. I mean, so I'm interested to um, and, and maybe hear from Nikki as well, but as to what appetite you think there might be for that and how we might even go about, you know, organizing, facilitating that conversation to happen. Could somebody, maybe Mickey Kashtan, could you summarize that? I was having a real hard time hearing it. Me too. I was hoping that you were able to, and I was thinking yeah. it's not my, it's not my language. I won't understand it. No, Mickey, you're so good at summarizing. I think, so, Gail was, uh, I think Gail was saying something along the lines of like, we're looking at a big global movement here and we're looking at, you know, a, a, a real global issue. So is there some kind of possibility after April potentially about bringing together those different world movements and collaboratively creating a kind of meta narrative on a global scale and what that might look like and how you might facilitate that process? This is one of the biggest debates in the left. I mean, all over the place. It's like Bernie Sanders is having debates, uh, you know, in talks with coalition meetings with uh, democratic socialists all over the globe to sort of talk about this. Lots of different people in the global south have, um, Evo Morales has talked about trying to create a meta narrative and 
and a global movement. Um, you know, so there, there's, there's some thinking strategically about this, but it's, uh, it's, it's not my realm of expertise, which is kind of like, how do you create what we call global popular fronts? <laughs> you know, the Marxist tradition has one of the most elaborate sort of discussions about how do you do that, right? Um, and it's very complex, you know, I, I'm not really sure. But what I do know and what I, from my experience in just, uh, and from, uh, you know, studying movements is that um, it takes, um, it takes a lot of work in both intentionally creating things that are global, but also thinking about what emerges. You need the right balance between design and emergence that makes that work. Uh, and the second thing I will say is that people need movement ecology. They need to understand that none of us are, one, one movement isn't, isn't isn't the end all be all. We have to be able to recognize and appreciate our movement tradition and our culture and other people's culture, you know? And we do, we do what's called social movement ecology training. And we also have a training that's led by Carlos Saavedra in the United States, which is a, in a, in a indigenous global indigenous perspective, um, which is called global reciprocity. Uh, and it's really his training of thinking about how do we build a movement of movements on a global scale and also how do we talk about the left in in different contexts and through a different a, a lens of history that's indigenous and whatever um it's it's very powerful work and uh and i i think that the first step that i think is that is people understanding the strengths and weaknesses of different what we call organizing traditions or social uh, justice and environmental justice traditions uh, throughout the globe and understanding um, how to be in, 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 in an ecology um, and the complexities of ecology. First, what we call simple collaboration of learning how to be in simply good relationship with people. And then as you go along, there is a process of really designing coalitions and popular fronts and things like this, which are super complex about how to do that. I mean, um, some of the, the great, the, some of the thinking that I think is very interesting is uh, D. Hawk is a decentralized theorist uh, that has this concept of what he calls the chaotic organization, which I think is fascinating for specifically this thing, which is how do you create coalitions? How do you create people with very diverse cultures that can create a meta culture or a culture of cultures for movements and things like this? I mean, he, he, uh, he's a very interesting character who, who's, who came out of capitalism, but he, his, his model is very interesting to give some detail about how you might think about creating a movement of movements on a global scale or even creating a coalition of environmental groups or climate justice groups in, in countries. Uh, there's a different process of thinking about how do you build uh, coalitions. Uh, I don't like the term coalition, but how do you build a popular front? How do you build uh, you know, a, a movement of movements? Can I just speak to that idea of a move, I like the movement of movement, the social ecology aspect, because, you know, um, with Bookchin's work and, and Rojava and, and, and how you see that movement of that, of that kind of decentralization in a global south kind of country where there's a lot of oppression against women, but they've put women at the center of it. And so, I don't know, I, I, I just, because I know that also that it may, you know, there's a whole other thing about it maybe disappearing because of what Trump, America pulling out, so I, but that protecting that ecology as well, that, you know, so there's a need almost to protect things that are potentially going extinct as well. Because, um, um, but how do you see that that particular? Uh, do you know much about that ecology? Because I've I've just been very interested in that particular ecology, movement. Say that again. The ecology uh, in Rojava in Syria. Oh and, yeah. Um, I, d I don't know that much about it. Uh, I do work uh, with uh, this woman, Brooke Lehman, at the Watershed Center, who's a, a Bookchiniite. Um, 
And uh, I know from talking to her, I know that I do not know <laughs> that, that tradition very well at all. Um, so I, I can't really comment about it. It's, it's, it, it, it is, that, that is an interesting organizing culture uh, that I think we have a lot to learn from, but I, I don't really know much about it. Could, could I just, I want to know, um, possibly, sorry, I know it's close to time, just, um, I just feel a bit inspired, but I don't feel as if I've quite said what I want to. Trying to deal with my accent, Mickey, sorry. Um, I like something that Mickey said on one of our calls where she said that you don't create a social movement, you just invite it into being, but it's ready to come. And I think that's why Extinction Rebellion on viral is because there's something that was ready to shift. And there's something in the emergency of these times which uh, changes the peace. And that, uh, you know, if, I'm not trying to say that environmentalism is more important than anything else. But what, what I want to say is that it's, it's, it's the, um, when are you actually say that piece? I think, I wonder if there's, um, like, one, one tactic that's to do with the finance system that might cohere people. Uh, I've got this idea for a while that people deliberately pay on loans. There was a guy in, in, in um, Spain that managed to get $300,000 of loans. By, I mean, he, he was a bit awesome. So we just deliberately take money out of the system and put it into a different system. Uh, I mean, I, I think something that mega needs to happen. And there's a, a point to stop and say about the genocide and the ecocide of these times and that but all of the struggles that I'm aware of have never fully succeeded because because the economy never changed. Um, so I, I guess I'm just really asking if this is not the time for that, when is it? And what would, what would we do next to, to think about that? And I might be asking Mickey if she could catch my accent enough. Did you, did you catch that, Paul or, or Mickey? Uh, about 60% of it. Um, I, 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 I have something I would like to say that may speak to this and Gail, please stop me if it doesn't. It, it, it's two things. One is that I always make a distinction between what is the acute issue and what is the root cause. And, um, Part of the dilemma I think that we're facing now is that clearly the root cause lies about 10,000 years ago and it has to do with patriarchy and everything that got put on top of it and now capitalism as the most virulent uh, aspect of it. And the acute experiences of people, even though they are affected by it, they don't see global climate change as something that immediately affects them if they are really struggling and it may be difficult for people to mobilize around this. So finding a frame that really brings people together is going to be a really, really, really important challenge. So it's kind of at the level of meta, meta, meta narrative maybe even that, um, that you know, I read something today that really struck me that a lot of labor organizing has been around globalization rather than around capitalism. And if neoliberalism is the marriage of globalization and capitalism, if you attack globalization, then neoliberalism will lead to right-wing populism. And whereas if you attack capitalism, you are more likely to create global connection around capitalism being the issue rather than globalization. So uh, I'm not imagining that right in the minus one minutes left to us, we will come up with it. But I see a lot of promise in this question of what is it that we can all be united around? It's a real root problem that we can all benefit from changing, even though it's affecting us very differently. So you can't compare spiritual malaise to not having enough food. But the fact that you can't compare them 
doesn't mean that one is more important than the other in any kind of deep root cause way. And how do you bring it together across that divide? I think that's a task for any movement that wants to tackle global issues on a large scale. That, that is what I wanted to say. I hope it's related, Gail, to anything that you wanted me to speak to. Well, I love what Mickey Kashtan said. Amen. I, I think right on. And I, I know we're kind of getting confused about meta, meta, you know, what the meta, meta is or whatever. But I think it's really important when you talk about social movement ecology, what we're talking about is movements have cultures. And those cultures, you know, sometimes you're powerless over the culture you're in and the organizations are designed within a certain culture. And so we have to make a distinction between are we creating a movement of movements or are we creating a movement that, that can be international? And then even in that movement that's international, like we're creating a movement that's, that's international, it's still going to relate to other movements in our issue group or even in a realignment, what we call a national realignment. So we're right now, why this is so confusing is we're talking at many different scales. And what I think is really important is, in a lot of what I've talked about this whole phone call, is really talking about a movement with the same with the same culture, but yet it has a diversity of cultures within it, so that the movement can be resilient to, to be international. It could go from one, like Extinction Rebellion, can go from the UK to the United States to Australia or whatever, or the Global South, Mexico and Ecuador or whatever. That's one type of thinking about building an international movement, but. A lot of the questions that we're just bringing up is the much bigger question of how do you create a movement of movements with many, you know, with many different movements, many different uh, theories of change, many different uh, issues that that have different priorities in different places, and how do you create a, a meta 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 narrative and all that stuff? And that's just it's super complex. Which doesn't make it any less important. And I, I personally would love to be in conversation with people who want to grapple with those questions. Oh, I think to me, um, the most interesting questions in the world. I think it's super fascinating, you know. And, and I see a conversation in our future, Paul. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Gail. Um, yeah, I, I know we're over time, so I, I guess we need to bring this to a close. And I, 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 I think it's complex, but it may be, but maybe there's just a simplicity at the heart of it, and it may be my naivety. But, you know, based on the idea of scarcity, separation, and powerlessness, I just feel such a call around our family reuniting, including with our tree family and our river family and our, you know, animal cousins. I know that's a particular ecological meaning, but our family reuniting and um, our our and, and not being scared of powerlessness, powerless in the face of the island system. I, I I feel like there is some piece there that could be simple because I feel like still today you'd have to have something simple and obvious at the heart of it. But um, I I just appreciate that door being open for that conversation and. Um, uh, I'm giving myself the last word there, which is a bit rude, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, there you go. There's the UK. You can't say the UK out of girls. Um, but I just wanted to thank everybody and really thank Paul and, uh, for, for coming on. And I hope people got something out of this. And I look forward to carrying on the conversation again in some other way as we try and figure this out. Lots of love, everybody. There's a lot, a lot of waves and uh, thumbs up that you can't see. Oh, great. Well, what, one thing I want to say, though, is just uh, the Momentum community, uh, which is all these movements that, that uh, the Momentum Training Institute helped incubate. Lizzie Romano, uh, Cicia Lee, um, uh, Mafe, you know, the leadership of Momentum uh, has a coaching wing that... Uh, that helps different movements. And I really recommend, they do great work. I really recommend them. Um, and they've helped many different movements. Mafe is the director of, of that coaching program. I really, so in the future, you know, uh, I really recommend reaching out to them. Um, and we're working with them here in the US already. We're doing coaching with them. Yes. Oh
uh, and they, you know, they've been doing great work in, in creating, we have uh, what we call skill shares between different movements in the United States, but particularly among the momentum movements. And uh, yeah, I think it'd be great if you guys, uh, if you all could, you know, uh, be in dialogue with them about, about different things. I think it would be very, um, yeah, I think it, it would really benefit you all. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks, Paul. Um, hopefully we can get that all done by April 15th. That'd be great. <laughs> um, cool. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming along. Paul and uh, yeah, big blessings and thanks and gratitude to Paul and Nikki and everyone else that contributed. And if you didn't contribute, thanks for coming along. Got the recordings of the call and some notes that we can share around to everyone afterwards. Um, but yeah, thank you so much and uh, catch you later. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Paul. Thank thanks. you, Paul. Thank you, everyone.